Look at this point and here. And uh, so they could really see the mass of this object and they found it's a mass of three million solar mass, so extremely massive object. And uh, you know, this passed extremely closely uh, to uh, basically f the distance that it passed to the cent galactic center is uh, just three times the, s the distance between the sun and the Pluto uh, planet. So extremely, on, on, on galactic scale, it's, uh, it's extremely uh, close. And so they could find out that there is a huge mass here, which is you know, basically point light, extremely uh, localized. And so the only possibility is that uh, there is a, a gigantic uh, black hole right at the center of our galaxy. And so now people are uh, um, studying this uh, black hole uh, at the galactic center. So now, what might be surprising to you is uh, the fact that associated with the presence of this black hole, uh, there is so much activity. Because as I said in the, in the standard picture, uh, and I try to uh, you know, remind you of it, you know, black, black holes are swallowing everything, sw uh, swallowing everything. So I remind you that in the theory of general relativity, black holes are singularities of space-time, predicted by the theory. And uh, uh, so there's one point in space-time which is uh, singular, and it is surrounded by what is known as a uh, horizon, and everything that falls below the horizon, so uh, that, that fall into this sphere, will be falling into the singularity. Everything that means matter, but also light. And because light is also swallowed by the black hole, they are called uh, you know, black holes, precisely. But you have to be careful that this is this only happens if you fall below this uh, sphere, below this horizon. Otherwise, you could be traveling uh, around the black hole and not be swallowed you know, by the singularity. And so for a long time, this was more like a uh, uh, you know, theorist uh, idea and almost a joke uh, played by, uh, by Einstein uh, until people realized that lots of these uh, sources of very energetic particles that we see in the universe are associated with black holes. And I try to show you in this simulation uh, that the black hole is surrounded by a region of very intense activity. What you will see in this simulation is that, so we start with a uh, 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 galaxy from a distance, it's a spiral galaxy, and then we plunge into it, and at the center of the galaxy there is a black hole. Okay, so this is, we are falling into the, the spiral galaxy, and uh, right at the center, Okay, you have, you know, the black hole is right at the center and you don't see it very well here because, uh, but there are some, there is matter that revolves around the black hole and really the singularity if on the black sphere at the center uh, is uh, you have the black hole and its horizon. But just to show you that around the horizon there are lots of things going on and uh, you, what you see here, so you have matter circling around, that's a, a, a disk of uh, which is accreted around the, the, the black hole. And quite often you have also jets of very energetic particles and that will play the role of a sort of cosmic accelerator. And so indeed, uh, one has found out that uh, quite often one has this structure, okay, right at the center you have a black hole, sometimes a neutron star, but let me take the example of a black hole. So right at the center you have this black hole, its horizon and the singularity, but around the black hole you have uh, a disk, what is called accretion disk, and jets of very relativistic, uh, uh, very uh, energetic particles. And that could be, that, that is found in the universe at very different mass scales. So, so it could be, uh, uh, you know, uh, the, the black hole could have a mass of uh, a solar mass typically, or a million times a solar mass. The distances could be uh, different, but the same type of uh, phenomena occurs at very different scales. And so until now, uh, all these objects have received different names, and you see, uh, you know, that they call quasar, microquasar, collapsar, and 
depending on the way you observe them, they could be called blazer or gamma ray burst. There are different phenomena associated to, to them, but in most cases, you have you know, this very simple structure that people have started in the recent years realize that it's, it's common to you know, these very different objects. Let me just take the, the example on the right-hand side, which is the, the example of a gamma ray burst, uh, because that will provide us with an example of a, what I call a cosmic accelerator. Well, gamma ray bursts uh, are the most luminous uh, events uh, known. Uh, uh, they were discovered, the, 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 the story of their discovery is interesting. They were discovered by uh, an American uh, military satellite uh, whose purpose was to probe the gamma emission uh, due to Soviet nuclear explosions. And uh, they were surprised, maybe they did find some nuclear explosions, but they did find on the, uh, looking towards the Earth, but the surprise thing was that they also found some big explosions in space. And they kept it secret for, uh, I, I guess, uh, uh, a few years until they released uh, the information. And so the, the, the first satellite was this Vesela satellite, uh, which discovered these huge explosions in space. And here's a, a, an example. But you see there is an explosion here. And this explosion is almost, sends as, in a few seconds, almost as much light as uh, you know, the whole galaxy. And so this is extremely distant. This has nothing to do with, uh, we know now that this is uh, you know, much beyond our galaxy. But still, for a few seconds, the explosion is so intense that it sends uh, this huge uh, blare uh, uh, of uh, photons uh, towards us. And so, uh, of course, uh, people want to study it because, uh, you know, this is a very violent source of, uh, of energetic, energetic particles. It's also because it's very, uh, you know, it sends lots of light, it's very luminous, it can be very distant, and so that would be a way of probing the very distant universe and so the very old universe. Even, uh, you know, it's even more luminous than supernova explosions. Uh, just to give you a sort of hint of uh, the way you know, these uh, uh, work, let me just uh, show you a simulation, uh, a model for gamma ray bursts, which I think is a standard model nowadays. Um, uh, you'll see this, the simulation in a second. Uh, let I just you know, sketch some of the uh, uh, main steps so that you recognize them when you see the little movie. Uh, we believe now that uh, gamma ray bursts are due to the uh, explosion of a very massive star uh, which ends its existence with an explosion. Basically, as, as was said uh, previously, uh, you know, the fuel for stars is, uh, is uh, you know, nuclear fuel, and at the end of the evolution of a star, the nuclear fuel dies out, and so the, the, the star will collapse just because of gravitational interaction. But it's only the, the inner core of the star that, that, that collapses. It releases some energy, and the, the rest of the star explodes. So you'll see uh, in a second this star, again, with our simulation, this star will, you'll see it from the outside exploding. But on the, on the inside, its inner core is actually uh, undergoing uh, a collapse, and it will be collapsing into a black hole. And this is believed to be uh, one of the ways that black holes are formed in uh, in the universe. Well, uh, in some cases, uh, at least the case of a gamma ray burst, uh, one believes that the collapse is not uniform. And uh, as you, you will see, there is, uh, because it's not uniform, there's a creation, and also because of magnetic fields, there's a creation of jets uh, of particles, very energetic particles. And uh, remember that the outer part of the star uh, has been exploding while the inner core is, is collapsing. And so the outer part is exploding, and this jet of particle will collide with the outer parts, and there are some particle physics uh, uh, interactions which exactly uh, work as in, uh, um, uh, as in uh, will accelerate the particles, exactly like in a particle physics accelerator. And so this is what I call a natural uh, cosmic uh, accelerator. So let me show you the, the movie, the simulation in the next. Uh, uh, so this is going to go quickly. So this is a star. Okay, so you'll uh, start exploding. So that's what it looks like outside. But in the inner core, the inner core is collapsing. 
is collapsing in a non-uniform way. You have these jets of particles, and these jets will collide with the uh, outer layers, and you'll see that in a second. And you know this will create some very strong particle acceleration, and uh, so this gives us two jets. And if you know, the beam of light is directed towards the Earth, then you see a gamma ray burst, and this is going to last a few seconds or a few minutes. Okay. Well, the main question of, you know, associated with these very energetic particles uh, are uh, how do cosmic accelerators function? I tried to give you a model, but of course, you know, you, you have to uh, check with observation, uh, you know, this, whether this is reality uh, or, you know, you have to change a model. Can, what can we learn from the study of energetic sources on the laws of physics? The formation of black holes, uh, you know, this is clearly associated with the formation of a black hole. Are there new states of matter at extreme energy or densities? Supernova explosions, uh, this was referred to uh, you know, by John Ellis. Uh, you know, this is also uh, a question that has to do with particle physics and the formation of heavy elements from, which is associated with the explosion of supernovas. Okay, uh, now you have, that you have produced with these cosmic accelerators very energetic uh, cosmic particles, then you have to detect them well, either in space with satellites or on Earth, and there are diverse ways of, uh, you know, that could be at the South Pole, that could be in the sea, that could be in Namibia. There are very diverse ways, very diverse places where you try to study these uh, very energetic cosmic particles known as, you know, which correspond to the... So, in, in a way, it's back, back to the old, you know, the beginning of particle physics with cosmic rays. We, we again, now study cosmic rays because, uh, you know, they are extremely energetic particles sometimes. Uh, and this is uh, what I call a new frontier. Uh, there are three different fields which are the art of particle astrophysics and we present a new window open on the sky. That means that we uh, have observed the sky in, in photons using light, uh, uh, different wavelengths, uh, X-rays, high energy gamma rays and so on. Uh, but now, uh, particle astrophysics uh, goal is to try to open new windows on the sky, window uh, or using ultra ener high energy cosmic rays. I'll, I'll say a few words about this. Using high energy neutrinos, and I, you know, borrow this the title "New Window on the Sky" to, uh, you know, this is, if you've ever seen the poster of, uh, you know, edited for the Nobel Prize 2002, given to Ray Davis and and, uh, and Koshiba. Uh, it was precisely called neutrinos were called a new window open on the sky and uh, I'll just, well you don't see, I'll, I'll come back to, to this experiment in a second. And uh, the final window which would be opened in the sky would be gravitational waves and I'll just say a few words about each three before concluding. Well, the enigma of extremely high energy cosmic rays. Just imagine that, you know, one of these events that I you know, showed you has produced a very energetic particles. This energetic particle will interact with uh, photons of a cosmic microwave background. And, uh, you know, there is, uh, it turns out that uh, if it's too energetic, well, uh, it, it, it will interact and you'll never see it on Earth. And so one believes, because of this interaction of very energetic particles with the cosmic microwave background, what should not observe on Earth, well, should observe very little, I should say, uh, particles of protons of very high energy, and energy is larger than 5, 5 10 to the 19 uh, electron volts, so a huge energy. Well, there are some indications that one observes, uh, you know, particles at higher energies, that, 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 you know, what these plots, uh, you know, are showing. So there's a question whether, you know, on Earth exists, uh, one can observe, you know, in principle, cosmic rays that are so energetic that they should have they should not be there because they should have interacted with the cosmic microwave background. There is, uh, just to show you an example, there is uh, in Argentina, built by uh, a world collaboration, an observatory where they try to observe these uh, very energetic uh, events. And uh, so they, they have covered the Argentinian Pampa uh, with, you know, these tanks, detectors, uh, 1,600 detectors, which cover an area of 3,000 kilometers squared. Now, why is, it, why is such a large area? It's just because, uh, you know, these cosmic rays, very high energetic cosmic rays are, you know, uh, when they interact with uh, uh, the atmosphere, 
are giving a big shower of particle of a you know a very large uh, area. Well, they are still installing some of these tanks, so uh, I'll go through quickly. But uh, you know the idea is precisely to look at those extremely energetic events, and because uh, you, uh, they are so energetic, as I said, you have to look at vast areas. Another possibility is uh, not to look at you know, these showers of particles from the ground, but to look from uh, above. And that's another experiment which is planned on the space station where you would look at them not from the ground, but you look at them, you look at the atmosphere and try to detect uh, you know, these uh, huge showers of particles. Now, uh, the second window open on the sky are neutrinos, and you know, the previous speakers have, have mentioned neutrinos. Uh, there is a rich program uh, of neutrino at CERN, and remember that neutrinos are interacting uh, very little with, uh, with matter. So that's good news for us, because if they come from a very distant uh, cosmic accelerator, they have been interacting very little with, uh, with the rest of matter, and so they might come uh, all the way to the Earth. Now, the trouble is that they are difficult to observe because they, interact, they won't interact much with your detector. And so the idea here is to use the whole Earth as a detector in the sense that you have, okay, you have a distant galaxy here. The neutrino has been tra traveling a very long distance. And when uh, it encounters the Earth, uh, some of the neutrinos will interact with some of the protons of the Earth, will give a muon, and you detect the muon on, at the, on the other side of the Earth. And one experiment is called Antares, and uh, those are detectors, particle physics detectors in the sea. And uh, what are interesting are not the particles that come from above, the particles that come from below, because if they come from below, they might have been, uh, you know, their origin might be a neutrino coming from a distant galaxy. So you, just to show you that uh, neutrinos are really Interesting because they interact very weakly, but on the other hand, uh, you need the whole Earth to, to make them interact in, uh, in, in, uh, enough. And the final uh, window open on the, uh, on the sky, new window open on the skies, are gravitational waves. In a way, uh, you know, general relativity tells us that space time is somewhat elastic. Uh, Einstein has told us that. When you put a mass or you localize energy, this disturbs, disturbs space time and curves it. And uh, so if you have uh, uh, massive objects, uh, uh, that will, just as you, know, you disturb the, the surface of water, uh, if you have uh, uh, an event which uh, implies lots of localized energy, it will curve space time and propagate along space time. And so uh, this is, uh, you expect that gravitational waves will propagate in, in space, and one tries to uh, look for them. One tries to look for them uh, on the ground using uh, uh, ground interferometers. One tries also to look for them in the sky, and this is the, the LISA mission, which uh, is supposed to be launched in 2012. This is a LISA-NASA mission. And uh, the idea is to look at the geometry of space-time and the possible changes associated with gravitational waves with three satellites which are in formation flights. These three satellites are at a distance, make a triangle. Distance between two satellites is five million kilometers. And uh, you shoot laser beams uh, you know, between the three satellites uh, in such a way that you try to form a, 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 you know, a triangle. You fix the distance to the nanometer. So it's really a technical, te technological challenge and uh, by looking at the motion of these three satellites in formation, uh, you hope to see, uh, to detect the presence of, uh, of, uh, of gravitational waves, which would be due, for example, to a supernova explosion or to the coalescence of two black holes, two black holes colliding uh, into one another. So uh, yeah, this looks like science fiction, but uh, uh, people are working very hard on, uh, you know, on, on these missions. Now, conclusions. Uh, well, first of all, the new field that the interface between uh, high energy physics and astrophysics has developed in the, in the last uh, 15 or 20 years. Uh, 
Cosmology and particle astrophysics provide ways to address fundamental questions which are absolutely complementary to, to, to the ones uh, raised in particle physics. I think you know, the list of questions that you know, I tried to uh, identify are very similar and, and quite often common to the kind of questions that uh, you know, particle physics in accelerators uh, uh, raise. There are new windows open on the universe. Uh, we still don't know how the universe will look like when you start receiving, detecting high energy neutrinos, gravitational waves, or ultra high energy cosmic rays. And so that might change our understanding of some of the critical issues I was discussing. And uh, particle accelerators, such as you know, the ones at CERN, and especially uh, you know, those ones, remain the places where one can make uh, experiments. It was, it's exactly what I was saying. Uh, the only place where you can make experiments is on Earth. Uh, you might get information from, uh, from the universe, but if you want to repeat something or to prepare something in a, a specific state, you have to make experiments. And so uh, uh, we might get clues from, uh, from space, but uh, any confirmation, decisive confirmation, will come, I think, from uh, accelerators. And finally, uh, on a more uh, political side and, uh, and talking about Europe, uh, you know, this field of particle astrophysics and cosmology is very lucky in Europe, and I would like to stress this point because uh, it, it is a field that, that uh, is, uh, at, lives at, in the middle of a triangle, uh, which is formed by, of course, CERN, but two other uh, European agencies, the European Space Agency and the European Southern Observatory, this, this free uh, uh, international uh, uh, agencies have, of course, uh, you know, already closed links. Uh, for example, I think it was not mentioned that CERN uh, hosted the ASO headquarters for, for quite some time. Uh, and certainly that gives confidence that you know, this field uh, will, if, if it uh, takes its strength from, uh, from you know, this triangle of uh, free very uh, successful organizations, uh, you know, this field uh, will you know, develop very well uh, in Europe. Thank you.